This is a Rook Media Series, The Contemporary History of Iran, Part 25. Hi there, and welcome to the Contemporary History of Iran, a series from Rook Media. This is part 25, The Impact of Mossadegh. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Our aim with this series is to explore the events, personalities, and issues that have shaped modern Iran. We want to do this as much as possible through a non-traditional lens, through snapshots of change, and using alternative voices or angles. This series is mostly in English and will feature a new episode posted every Thursday across our Rook Media platforms. We will post subtitled excerpts with Farsi Zirnavis on our YouTube and Instagram sites. We are coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms, and we invite you to check out parts 1 through 24 of this series that are already posted. To become a sponsor or patron of Rook Media, please contact us through our website. All right, let's get started. Here now is the Contemporary History of Iran, part 25. Well, other than the revolution of 1979, there is arguably no event in the contemporary history of Iran that generates more discussion, assessment, and perhaps disagreement than the 1953 overthrow of Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh. In the view of some, the coup of 1953 not only undermined Iran's first democratically elected government, but set the course of events and autocratic rule that would lead to a popular revolution which would end the monarchy and result in the formation of a theocracy only 25 years later. But what led to the downfall of a popular prime minister in the 1950s? Was it indeed a coup? And how long was this coup in the planning? New evidence in recent years and a new book by my guest today makes the case that in the early 1950s, the United States set out to systematically meddle in Iranian domestic affairs to overthrow Mossadegh, and that this was not something sudden or reflexive, but long orchestrated involving bribes, psychological warfare, an economic embargo, and fear-mongering. You might say the impact of the actions of the nationalist prime minister created too much concern for the West and those in power in the United States, and the contention was that he had to be stopped. What was the impact of Mossadegh, and how did it resonate even after an American-enabled coup? My feature guest today has been described as one of the preeminent Iranian historians of his generation and a leading historian on modern Iran. And as I mentioned, he's recently published a book about the coup of 1953 and new revelations of the American involvement in the overthrow of the Mossadegh government and the connection to oil nationalism. Dr. Yervand Abrahamian is a renowned Iranian-American scholar and author. He is the Distinguished Professor of Iranian and Middle Eastern History and Politics at the City University of New York. He is also a member of the International Iranian Studies Association, the American Historical Association, and the Middle East Studies Association of North America. Dr. Abrahamian was born in Tehran and grew up partly in Iran, partly in England. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees from Oxford. Oxford University and his doctorate from Columbia University in New York. He has in the past taught at Princeton, New York University, and Oxford. He is the author of several acclaimed books on 20th century Iran, including his celebrated book, Iran Between Two Revolutions, which is a standard text for the study of modern Iran now. Dr. Abrahamian's latest book, Oil Crisis in Iran, From Nationalism to Coup d'Etat, was published last year and right now. It's a great pleasure to have Dr. Yervand Abrahamian join me from New York today. Hello, sir. 
Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. I know this is part of two talks we're going to have, the first being on the, the impact of Mossadegh and, and uh, the American involvement in the early 50s, the next on, on our next episode about Khomeiniism. And the two are not entirely unrelated, as it turns out, now that I've read your books. Thank you so much for doing this and for making the time. It's my pleasure. Let me start by, uh, if you will, asking you to engage in some historiography to give us a context for the discussion we're about to have. You know, the first four words in your book about nationalism, oil, and the 53 coup are the following. History is about arguments. Um, and when it comes to assessing the dramatic rise and then the overthrow of Mossadegh from 51 to 53, there are certainly arguments. There was an old orthodox argument uh, that said that there was a coup in 53 in Iran, but that it was about repressing the left and saving Iran from communism rather than anything to do with oil nationalism. Is there any validity to that argument about communism? Well, of course, in 1953, it was the height of the Cold War. And so the, you can say the world's the concerns at the time was the Cold War. From that, it's, hard, it's a big jump to say that everything that happened in that period was directly related to the Cold War. And my argument is that the 53 coup had very little to do with the Cold War. Um, it was a good pretext because this was the discourse of the time. You could justify it in American public by saying communism was about to take over Iran, so U.S. had to carry out a coup. Um, as some people have said, the Dulleses, if they wanted to throw their grandmother under the a bus, they could always basically resort to the fear of the Cold War and the fear of communism. Right. But the documents very much showed that there was really, people in the know uh, knew perfectly well there was no real communist danger in Iran, nor a Soviet threat from the North. Okay. So the real issue had nothing to do with the, uh, communism as such. And while we're doing the historiography, let me throw another one at you. There's a there's been a revisionist view of history that there actually was no coup, that there uh, was an uprising and that uh, Mossadegh had become very unpopular and that this was just a, a response to bad government, that the Shah simply dismissed him as it was the Shah's legal prerogative to do. Um, what do we make of that? Well, again, that's a lot of false premises there. The, the Shah did not have the constitutional right at that time. Uh, to dismiss a, a prime minister. Only the match less could do that by a vote of no confidence. Um, also, the idea that somehow the government was collapsing, again, the documents show that they, uh, it was not. In fact, both the, America, the State Department and the Foreign Office in London were quite sure that Mossadegh was actually quite well entrenched um, and the state was quite viable. Uh, in fact, they carried out the coup precisely because it, it, they realized that the, uh, the, the, the Mossadegh government was not going to collapse. Uh, Mossadegh had actually outwitted most of the opposition uh, during the period from 51, 53. And the issues that were brought up, such as economic collapse, it just was not true. It, it, uh, the economy was agricultural. Uh, the, the oil revenues were never that big at that time. Uh, so lot, cutting off of oil revenues was not bankrupting the government. Um, and Iran actually was quite effective at running the refinery, um, the Abadan refinery, uh, the constant mess, uh, 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 hoo-ha was that, well, Iranians couldn't run the, uh, the, the refinery uh, once the British left, the whole system would collapse. But uh, the World Bank in 1953, in fact, discovered that the oil refinery was working perfectly well. Uh, the Iranian engineers were quite capable of uh, running the place. If they wanted higher, uh, higher production, they would have had to have foreign advisors, foreign technicians come in, but that would have been something in the future. In 53, they were, Iran 
by itself was capable of running the refinery. What about the, I mean, you, you can't be unfamiliar with these arguments. We had a, a former editor of Cajon uh, newspaper say, you know, by 53, Mossadegh was, was deeply unpopular. The population didn't want him. It, it, I mean, what do you say to something like that? It's, it's just not true. I mean, if there was a mass opposition, you would have demonstrations, strikes. In fact, uh, Mossad Dech was able to bring out large numbers of people out in the streets in his, in his own support. Um, and when the Shah left uh, uh, Tehran uh, for Baghdad in, in uh, just three days before the coup, there was a mass, basically, a, a outpouring of anti-Shah demonstrations. Uh, so the, the, on the day of the coup, there were demonstrations in pro support of the Shah, but they're quite small, actually, and it was a hard demonstrations. We know that pretty well from the documents, both the MI6 and the CIA uh, spent a lot of money to get together what a uh, uh, crowd basically of uh, mobilized by the Chagwa Keshan, the thugs from the southern Tehran who were for hire. Uh, so the idea that somehow there was a, a, a very great deal of unpopularity and this unpopularity expressed itself in uh, a public opposition is, is just not true. Okay. Well, since you've um, referenced the documents a few times, I want to get to that new information that was released in recent years that shows U.S. involvement in a coup to overthrow the Mossadegh government and that you've written about. Uh, but let, let me ask you about Mossadegh himself first, because he's a he's a most fascinating character. I mean, this this is, um, as many of us, you know, certainly in my mind, he's kind of burned, the image of him burned into my mind as this frail old man that captures the imagination of Iranians in the early 1950s and, and for a time the entire world, of course, in the cover of Time magazine, etc. How are we to understand who Mossadegh was before this point? How would you describe him in his early years? Well, there are two aspects from him. One is that really he is a product of the Mashrut Yatta constitutional revolution. So he's very committed to the constitution. Um, often people considered him anti-British, but he was a great admirer of the British constitution, the notion that the, uh, the monarch should reign, not rule. So he often referred to basically the limitations on the executive and on the, on, on the monarch and the role of the majlis. So he, this brought him in conflict with the Shah, but it made him also uh, very much in the trend of uh, the uh, constitutional revolution. But the other aspect of him that actually relates much more to the oil issue, he was seen as very much as a, uh, as a patriot, as a nationalist who wanted to have Iran uh, very much independent of the foreign powers. And the foreign powers, of course, historically in Iran had been uh, the, nor the northern neighbor, uh, euphemistically the, the, referring to the R Russian Tsarist Empire, and the British Empire, the Southern Empire in India and the Persian Gulf. And his notion of being independent was uh, ba balancing the two off and not, in fact, giving concessions to either one side, because if you gave concessions to one side, the other side would want more concessions. So his, his, uh, Nationalism was very much expressed in modern terms would be a neutralism, new, new, neutrality in international politics. Do we have any sense of his his presence in his early years? I mean, he he was famously the first Iranian to receive a PhD in law from a European university. Was would he have been someone, say, in his early twenties, who was expected to do great things? Yes, I mean, his father had also been, of course, uh, a senior uh, a bureaucrat, like a Mandarin in the uh, uh, Persian uh, administrative system. He was brought up as that. And here also he had built up uh, a reputation of being very honest, uh, clean, uh, not taking bribes. And this, of course, made him sort of stick out from 
others because usually the old aristocracy was considered corrupt uh, and he was viewed as incorruptible um, in a way sometimes it, people attacked him especially the British was that he was like a rope spear he was so <laughs> incorruptible um, and therefore dangerous <laughs> um, but that, so he had this reputation that I, I appealed I think to the common a person in the street that he was not someone on the take for money he he was in politics because of his patriotism and uh, his nationalism it, it, it was this, this also this patriotism that very much brought him at loggerheads with the british yeah let me get um, let me get to that i i yeah. i actually first i just wanted to you know it was a revelation to me and 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 studying him that um that he he has this remarkable in and out zigzag in and out of politics for about 40 50 years uh, it, it's like a pinball machine i mean i i tried to list it here elected at 24th at the majlis after the constitutional revolution couldn't serve because he hadn't reached the legal age of 30 goes to switzerland comes back goes into politics retires again from politics due to disagreements with the new reza shah regime does another stint in parliament in the 40s is instrumental in creating the national front intent on nationalizing oil then he he retires then he's appointed of course uh, the Shah uh, by the Shah as Prime Minister in April uh, 1951 after the Majlis nominates him by a massive vote you you referenced that Mossadegh saw um, in a constitutional monarchy an antidote to Iranian autocracy what did he believe the role of the Shah should be um, very much like the monarchs in Western Europe. Of course, the Iranian constitution was based on the Belgium constitution, where the monarch was just a figurehead and had ceremonial roles, but was not supposed to be involved in actual nitty-gritty of politics. And parliament uh, was the central institution uh, where prime ministers were made or unmade, all the ministers had to basically get the approval of the match less. So it was very much of a, a parliamentary system that the uh, constitutional revolution had set up, and he was very much committed to that. You made the case a moment ago about um, Mossadegh's, um, at least the perception of his incorruptibility. Um, and also you talked about his patriotism, the intense nationalism that you write about um, leading the, to the British and the Americans resenting him. Um, this thing about the nationalism, I mean, uh, it's curious to me. What, uh, Reza Shah, a decade before him, was also intensely nationalistic. What, what made Mossadegh's nationalist streak different in the eyes of the U.S.? Well, uh, Reza Shah was a nationalist in that he wanted to build um, a strong centralized state. Uh, so the main achievement of Reza Shah was the creation of the state that really had not existed before with central uh, ministries, uh, central army. And these things actually Mossadegh was not against. What Mossadegh wanted was also that the state should be responsible to the public and the majlis should be the central body of the state. Um, so that brought him in loggerheads with both Reza Shah and Mohammed Reza Shah because Mohammed Reza Shah, as soon as he came to power, to the throne in 1941, was in fact working hard to retain or to get preserve as much of his father's powers as he could, especially over control over the army, the armed forces. When and how does the the idea of oil nationalization assert itself? It it becomes important because um, after World War II more and more countries were getting independence, like India, Pakistan, then, of course, African states, then Asian states, Indonesia, and so on. So this was the age of rising independent states, former colonial states that were reasserting themselves as independent. Now, Iran, although formerly had never been a colony of uh, Britain, it was in fact a semi-colony in that its main resource, oil, was controlled by the British. 
And f the perception in Iran very much was that the country was actually controlled by the British because the British oil company owned and uh, monopolized the oil industry. So through the oil industry, uh, the British were able to make and unmake prime ministers, uh, ministers, uh, governors, and that the real power behind the throne in Iran was the oil company. So from the a nationalistic point of view was Mossad that had was the way to become independent like other countries like India was for Iran to be able to take over control nationalize its oil industry and so the nationalization of oil industry was not just an, a dollar cent issue of getting more income it was really a declaration of independence from Britain. So there's a very sort of uh, significant scene w uh, when oil industry is nationalized. The oil company flag comes down in Khoramshahr and Abadan, and instead the Iranian flag goes up right, there. Right. This was a way like, like saying Iran has finally become independent. Can I just ask you about um, Mossadegh's role uh, specifically in in the cause of nationalization? I mean, obviously, he was instrumental in the National Front, and that was a big um, uh, mission of the National Front. But th this has been pointed out to me when we've had a previous discussions on this program about the 1953 coup. Those who are less, perhaps, enthusiastic about a um, a version of history that sees Mossadegh as a uh, as a hero um, tend to say well the nationalization happened before he was prime minister uh, I guess it was about a month before right so um, what was his specific role in this uh, mission oh no I mean it was crucial because the committee that actually uh, recommended nationalization was actually controlled by the his supporters national front and it was clearly seen when the majlis voted for nationalization it was seen as a victory for mossad there because he was the main person who had been advocating uh, nationalization uh, others we're talking about a better concession, better agreement, or getting more than 17% of the income, let's say increasing the percentage of income. Some even to, were talking about a 50-50% sharing of profits, like the Americans were giving Venezuela and other countries. But for Mossad and the National Front, that wasn't the issue of getting more income. The issue was really getting control over the oil industry, which was nationalization. And this was very much uh, uh, an idea, an argument that Mossad there pushed. It was not something that others had advocated. Uh, you may have got heard, heard people in the street talk about it. Some of the oil strikers, oil workers had talked about in slogans of oil nationalization but in the political arena, it was uh, it was very much uh, an idea uh, of of the national fr front. So, in in March of 1951, the Anglo Persian oil company is is nationalized. I want you to, if you can, reflect on how that goes down in the West. And and um, something that I found very interesting that you point out in your book is you, you note that early on, around that time in the 1950s, the American strategy is to convince Mossadegh to agree to some kind of hollow form of nationalization or phony nationalization of oil. What what would that mean exactly? Well, as soon as it was Mossadegh actually became prime minister, the, the U.S. Truman sent a special emissary to Tehran to try to persuade the Shah not to sign the oil uh, 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 nationalization bill. Uh, they misunderstood the constitution. The Shah didn't have those powers not to sign, but the Majlis had already voted on it. So the, uh, the Shah's signing was a pre pro forma thing. But when um, this emissary arrived in Tehran, discovered he really, the Shah couldn't do that uh, and was not willing to do that, uh, he came up with this quite clever formula where uh, 
U.S. would accept in principle the notion of nationalization uh, so that U.S. would say, could argue that U.S. is not against nationalization. But when it came to actually drawing up a new concession, uh, the U.S. would insist that Iran would not actually control the oil industry. <laughs> it would be controlled by uh, either the British or a consortium, which <laughs> right. eventually was. So it, it was a lot of double talk. Right. But it was a very clever double talk because the press and the outside world, right from the beginning and even continues to the present day, think that the U.S. actually accepted and was willing to agree to nationalization. But it's was just not, not true. It's interesting, too, in what it says about what the U.S. thought of of Iranians or, or the prime minister, that, that the, the idea that, look, it, it, we'll let you run around saying that you nationalized, <laughs> but but we won't actually let you do it, you know, uh, and no one will find out, surely. Yeah. Uh, how, how much were the, Dr. Abrahamian, how, how much were the Americans and British concerned about oil nationalism in Iran in terms of the economic implications with respect to Iranian oil in particular? And how much were they concerned about um, the threat of a nationalist example that would be then copied by other oil-rich countries? Well, for Britain, of course, the nationalization hit them directly. But I think where U.S. and the Britain had a common interest and a common fear was that if this was successful, it would spread like a contagion. And they mention it, you know, people in Iraq are already interested in what's going on in Iran. The Persian Gulf states had uh, concessions to, with American companies. Then you had Venezuela, you had Indonesia. So it, it uh, was a fear that a successful uh, nationalization in one country would not be contained in that one country. It would quickly spread. Um, so, uh, I mean, there were sometimes even paranoid notions. The British drew up a list of all the different industries that could be nationalized, copper, you know, uh, minerals, coal, and so on, and said, you know, if, if this is successful, it's going to have worldwide effects, including, of course, American interests like in copper, uh, because uh, other producers of raw materials will do the same thing. Of course, I think this was paranoid. There was no real danger of that, but there was a da real danger that other oil company, countries uh, would imitate Iran. And of course, this happen, did happen in the 70s. In mm. the 1970s, you do have oil nationalization. Mm. But in 1950s, it was considered like the end of the world as we know it, if there was such a thing. Mm. And the American oil companies were quite adamant that they, they, they would prefer Iran to go communist rather than succeed in oil nationalization. You know, after this nationalization, um, Mossadegh, if he was already popular, his popularity skyrockets to a whole other level. When describing his popularity with Iranians in the early 50s, you you at one point say in your book, I want to quote you, to the common people, Mossadegh was looked upon almost as a demigod. Uh, that, that's quite a word to use. What What do you view made him so outstandingly popular? Well, actually, I'm not sure if it was my words or I was quoting a, a, a British document or an American document, okay. the demigod. Uh, I think it was, again, uh, he, in part because he was seen as a reputable politician who was not corrupt. Uh, you know, there were a lot of other politicians in Iran who had an even longer record of being statesmen than Mossadegh, but they were usually considered somewhat shady characters uh, who dealt that underhanded manner of maybe personally corrupt or family corruption and so on. But Mossadegh was seen as above that. And also that he was willing to stick to his guns and be consistent throughout his career. Um, 
And here the the idea of neutralism, I think, also was a way of saying the country will become independent. Uh, there were other politicians who had been in the past identified either with Britain or uh, the Soviet Union. And Mossadegh, although he didn't indulge in anti-Soviet rhetoric, he'd always kept his distance from the Soviet Union. Was he a good orator? Would he have? Um, yeah, no, he was also a good orator. Yes, like, like um, if he if yeah. he existed today in the social media twenty first century, would he be a successful leader in your view? Uh, yes, he was a good speaker. I mean, the British considered him a windbag because he look, talked at the long, <laughs> long <laughs> sessions. But uh, also, they didn't like what he was saying. But I think for for Iranian audiences, it was actually he was a good or, or, orator. So there's there's a lot of what you um, bring to us in this latest book uh, is not just a, a speculative. I mean you've 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 got this uh, the information now the empirical evidence is in these new documents that you've referenced a few times in this in this interview. Um, there, there's a 30 year rule, as I understand it, about the U.S. declassifying information of its activities in foreign countries. That would mean that new info about uh, the early 1950s should have come out in the early 80s about the U.S. role, say, in the overthrow of Mossadegh. Where was that info and why was it not released until pretty much 2017? Well, there was a volume uh, of the foreign relations of, the, of U.S. Uh, published in 1987, but it was so skimpy that it caused a scandal in the American Historical Association. Um, it had absolutely nothing on the coup, but it also had long months where there was no correspondence between the American embassy in Tehran and the State Department, vice versa. And this would seem strange to you that you have a, a, a country in a crisis and no communications between uh, between the embassy and mm -hmm. the State Department. So the American Historical Association kicked up a fuss and persuaded actually through Congress to get the State Department to reissue a new version of the volume of the Mossadegh period documents. Uh, so a lot of, there was a lot of uh, false starts. Eventually, the new volume did not come out until recently, two, uh, 217. I was going to say, it took, took them another 30 years to, to get yes, the, yes. the new volume. Yeah. Why is that? I mean, who's, who makes the decision to hold that information back? Uh, the State Department. Uh, I mean, they have to go through the documents to make sure that, you know, th there's nothing that might endanger someone's life. But also in this, there was a complication, or at least the State Department said there was a complication that the British didn't want any of the documents to implicate the British in the coup. Uh, so it was the British that held it up. But I suspect what really held up the documents was the State Department has this facade that they don't get involved in internal politics of the countries. Right. So the ambassador is not supposed to get involved in the nitty-gritty of the host country. And these documents reveal, in fact, how deeply the U.S. was involved in uh, Iranian politics throughout the Mossadegh period. Uh, the presumption always would be that after the coup, the U.S. was involved. But the new documents are very revealing in that they show the U.S. was very much involved from 51 to 53 uh, under Mossadegh in internal politics. It, it involved literally in who is represented in the Majlis, yes? Yes, I mean, nitty-gritty of, you know, making sure that the right deputies are elected, uh, that a lot of uh, journalists are paid off or, or uh, accept articles that are planted by the CIA in their newspapers. Uh, 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 also, of course, U.S. was involved in the military missions. There, th there were three military missions that uh, the U.S. Uh, trained. Um, 
So uh, you find, I mean, I think that the main reason these documents are important, but also they were held back, is they're a goldmine of information on internal Iranian politics and mm -hmm. how U.S. was involved. Something that we also learn in these documents is that, um, you see, I've always thought of the, the, the coup as the Eisenhower administration uh, uh, being the, the ones who would, you know, sort of undermine Mossadegh or, or preside over this coup. The, these documents confirm that in early 1952, so this is then the the Truman administration, right, is, is looking for a replacement for Mossadegh. And this is not intended to be a coup, but a something of a replacement that and that leads to something called the July uprising what can you what have we learned about this what can you tell us yeah I mean to use a modern uh, for term it's a deep state what you find is there is a deep state in during the Truman administration it's actually manned by diehard Republicans in this CIA desk on Iran. Um, the, the usual impression is, as you mentioned, that the Eisenhower comes in and there's a, the coup put in. But in fact, the people who put in the coup under Eisenhower were already running the Iran desk in the CIA as early as 1951. So Alan Dulles was in fact in charge of the Iran desk in the CIA as early as April 51. And there, what you find interesting, I, th I think fascinating, is there is a tug of war um, right from uh, the, the moment Mossadegh comes in, 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 as a prime minister all the way to the end. Tug of war between, I would say, the deep state in the CIA that is talking about that we can't really de de deal with Mossadegh. The only way to get rid of him is, uh, the only way to deal with him is to get rid of him, either a coup or political uh, 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 ex uh, removal. And they're more uh, down to earth, uh, many of them academics in the State Department who argued that no, uh, Mossadegh and the National Front represents the rising middle class. They are the future of Iran, and we should try to work with them. So every time there is a national intelligence estimate, NIE, which the National Security Council is supposed to pre uh, uh, periodically draw up for various countries, every time there is a time to put this document on paper, there's a constant tug of war between the deep state and the CIA and these more State Department down-to-earth people about what they should put in. The CIA is always talking about, you know, the, 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 the Mossad government is about to collapse, it's incompetent, there are too many problems, the communists will take over. Meanwhile, the State Department is arguing that no, uh, well, we can basically, it's a stable regime. Uh, we should try to, 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 uh, to deal with them. Or if, we, if we're going to do anything, we have to do it politically, not through a military coup. Mm. So uh, once the Truman administration comes to the conclusion that they can't persuade Mossad to accept a phony type of nationalization, they actually, quite early on in 1952, uh, May of 52, I would say, decide that they have to find some uh, alt, uh, some replacement with, for, for Mossadegh uh, through the parliamentary means. Um, and this is where already the influence the U.S. had in the Majlis, in the parliament, was effective, that they could actually try to mobilize enough votes there uh, to bring in Gavam, who was an old-time politician, right. a very Machiavellian, clever, but also considered very corrupt, uh, to become prime minister because Gavam had actually told Henderson, the American ambassador, that he was willing to come to an agreement about the oil issue. Um, so uh, the, the 
book that Truman administration was not averse to replacing Mossad there, but it was averse to a coup. Uh, and now, whether that was due to uh, principles that somehow Democrats were against military coups right. <laughs> or whether there were other reasons, I would say there were other reasons for that that was actually determined and prevented a coup during the Truman administration. But the, the attempted replacement uh, clearly doesn't work out and leads to something called the July Uprising. Can you briefly tell us what that is? Yes. Well, in, in May of 52, uh, there was a meeting in Washington with, with the CIA and the MI6, and they actually looked at the credentials of 18 uh, prominent politicians who could possibly replace Mossad. It was like uh, trying to recruit a new candidate <laughs> for a job. Right, right. So they went through these candidates, and the, the one they came up as the uh, the most uh, uh, likely one to succeed was Ravon. So uh, uh, Henderson happened to bump into Ravon purely by accident, because according to the documents, at a reception and agreed to meet with a private dinner with Ravon a few days later. And after that, Henderson became more gung-ho that Ravon would make a perfect replacement. And in July of 1953, uh, 52, uh, there was a slight, uh, not a majority, but a number of deputies were not in the majlis, so they got enough of votes to have Ravon replace Mossadegh as prime minister. And this caused an uproar, uh, basically uh, protests throughout the main cities. In Iran, it's known as Siatir. Uh, 30th of T, uh, it's, uh, in, in July, th th it was three days of the mass demonstrations. Um, there was some bloodshed and, uh, things got so basically tense that people were talking about another 1917 or something. And the, Ar the Shah uh, withdrew the army from the streets and Ravom had no choice but to resigned, and Mossadegh came back as Prime Minister victorious. So that was actually the apex of Mossadegh's uh, power, because after that he was able to put his own uh, general in charge of the military right. uh, for the first time actually since 1921, that the Shah had not directly appointed the chief of right. uh, the chief of staff, and, so and something a, that the Shah had steadfastly opposed, and then yes, caved yes. on, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Nevertheless, a, a year later, Mossadegh is gone. Uh, there is a there is a coup, and it seems like there's a um, a trifecta of of elements here that are in, inextricably linked that 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 oversee this coup. There's the Americans, the British, and then the there's Iranians who are complicit in this. The the you know uh, pro Shah or whomever they may be, uh, um, and they can't sort of do it without each other. The, the the Americans would need the Iranians. The Iranians couldn't. There couldn't be a, a coup without the Americans and the British. I don't mean to be reductive about this, but who finally pulls the trigger? I, how how does it how does it actually happen? Well, it, I think the final person, it's a crucial person, is the Shah. In fact, the, the, the State Department and the more uh, down-to-earth people in the State Department constantly say there's no, you can't carry out a coup unless you have the support of the Shah. Why? Because they know that the army officers, especially tank officers, in the 50s to carry out a coup, military coup, you really needed tank officers. The tank officers, there were a core of young tank officers who you could say are monarchist, royalists. And they would not act unless they had basically the okay from the Shah. Uh, so what held back the coup was ironically the Shah. Uh, yes. The Shah proved to be the most astute and I think foresighted of all the uh, of all his advisors, and uh, so, uh, uh, more actually astute than the foreign ambassadors. He was constantly saying to 
the ambassadors that I cannot go against Mossad there. I cannot go against oil nationalization because if I do that, that will delegitimize not only my monarchy, but the whole monarchy. Because by the way, uh, they pressure the Shah back to 1951, right? The Americans and the British are saying, remove Mossadegh and replace him. And the Shah doesn't do so at that point, right? This is why you're saying he's shrewd. But uh, despite that steadfast opposition to overseeing a military coup, he does accede to it by 1953. After a great deal of pressure. And I think what this sort of comes out in the documents uh, is that eventually the U.S. gives him an ultimatum that they're going to go along with the coup, whether he's in it or not, and that they can't guarantee that after the coup, one of his brothers will not be would not be Shah. Uh, so if the Shah hearing that, basically it, it, it means basically that's the end of him, and he has plenty of uh, brothers who are rivals of his who would be quite happy to replace him. So... I think that's one, I would say, last straw that makes the Shah join the coup. But, but there are other things that come into play. Early on, when they're talking about the coup, they, the, the CIA chooses General Zahedi as the person to lead the coup. And Zoyedi tells the Americans that, oh, he has so many people in the army that who would carry out the coup in his behalf. And the Shah knows this is a lot of bluff. He knows that Zoyedi really has no support. Zoyedi had support among retired generals, but it, retired generals are not in a position to carry out a coup. You really need uh, commissioned officers, especially tank officers. Uh, and Zahedi didn't have that. I think what helped uh, eventually to persuade the Shah to carry out, to join the coup, was that uh, there was a colonel by the name of Colonel Akhavi, who had for years been also in the MI6 and also had been head of the, uh, military intelligence, G2. So he knew the young officers, and he presented the Shah, this would be very late in the day, or in August of 1953, he presented the Shah not just a vague uh, promise that, oh yeah, the young officers are willing to carry out a coup in your name, he actually presented the Shah with 40 names of officers. Uh, presumably these are, you know, commissioned officers. We don't have the names we don't have the list, but we know from the CIA reports that he did actually give the Shah 40 names of people who were willing to participate in the coup. And at that point, the Shah knew this was not a bluff. People were not just talk talking off their bat. Uh, they were going to be willing to do it. And uh, that would have also persuaded the Shah then uh, to participate even though he knew this would be undermining the monarchy. Eventually. Did, did, did he have a choice? I mean, uh, it's always easy to look this look at this um, through the, the prism of, uh, you know, uh, uh, almost you know, 70 years later or whatever. But, uh, but could the Shah have done this differently if he's under that kind of immense pressure? It's generally seen as this is the, the moment of weakness that he, he gives in to the, to the Americans. What is your personal view on that? I think he, he he could have not participated, and if he had not participated, it wouldn't have been that uh, sure that these officers who were crucial would have carried out orders from uh, from Zahedi. They were contemptuous of someone like Zahedi. Uh, so there was this aura around the Shah among young officers that he represented the young Iran, the, the the young army officers, Western trained officers. So if the Shah had withheld his, uh, his uh, support, I'm not sure if the coup would have succeeded. And then he, he may have actually survived because after all, Mossadegh was not anti-monarchist. 
Uh, he was quite happy to have the Shah remain as the titular head of the state. Uh, so he, even after the Shah left, uh, Mossadegh did refuse to talk about a republic. There's, there's also a, a fascinating twist in, in this um, period that um, reverberates uh, 25 years later when when uh, we, we see the coming or the um, culmination, the co-opting uh, uh, that leads to an Islamic republic of a revolution. Uh, and that is the role of the clergy at this point, who one would assume are anti-monarchy, but play an interesting role here in the downfall of Mossadegh. What can you tell us about the role of the clergy? It, the, the revisionist argument now is that, of course, there was this unpopularity in, with the Vosatech uh, and the clergy was the, uh, were the people who really were instrumental in the coup. They even argued that there, well, there were no tanks in the streets, there was no military coup, it was basically the, po the uh, masses in the street led by the clergy. Now, there's an element of truth in that, in that the the crowd from the Chago Keshon, uh, from the southern Tehran, they were linked to one prominent uh, cleric, uh, Ayatollah Behbahani, who was not a just pure cleric, he was really a courtier, a member of the court. And the money that both the British and the Americans spent in the, for the coup was transmitted through Behbahani. Uh, in fact, the, the, it was uh, at that time in the streets of Tehran, the money that was spent for the demonstration was known as Behbahani dollars. So he was instrumental in, uh, I would say, carrying out the coup. Uh, but the clergy as a whole is much more complicated. The Grand Ayatollah Burujerdi. Uh, we know from the documents that the CIA tried to persuade uh, Beh Bahani to go to Buru Jardi and get a fatwa from Buru Jardi against Mossadegh and against communism, and that would justify basically the overthrow. They failed to do that, so Buru Jardi actually remained what he called uh, apolitical or quartist. Uh, his whole theme in politics was that high clergymen should not be involved in uh, nitty-gritty of politics because politics is a dirty business and the clerics should not get dirty in dirty business. So for him and also the seminaries in Rome were very careful not to get involved in political disputes. Now there was one exception to this was Ayato Kashani, who had supported oil nationalization, had supported Mossadegh, and but broke with Mossadegh in 1952. Mm. So often the notion is that Kashani was instrumental in the coup. Uh, the new documents actually show that Kashani was not involved in the coup. Uh, it's not because he would, would have opposed it. It's probably the CIA and the British didn't trust Kashani enough to have him in what they said in the loop of, in the knowledge of what was going on. But Kashani was used very much by the CIA and MI6 in undermining Mossadegh in the Majlis. Because Kashani was a, a nominally a member of the Majlis, and he had a group of supporters in the Majlis who uh, carried out obstructionism in Parliament to make sure that the uh, administration c could not carry out any reforms. So in that way, Kashani was involved in undermining the administration, but not actually in the coup. Mm. Then there's another complication that you also, even to the end, you find a number of clergymen who actually remained very supportive of Mossadegh. So the idea that somehow the clergy were involved in the coup or were anti-Mossadegh doesn't empirically hold up. There were plenty of clerics who had supported Mossadegh, remained supportive of Mossadegh, and continued to support Mossadegh even after the coup. 
uh, most important one was, uh, of course, Ayatollah uh, Talagani in right, Tehran. Right, right. Dr. Abrahamian, I'm, I'm, I'm so uh, um, genuinely grateful for the time you're giving us and, and uh, for this discussion. And, and I've, I've said earlier that this is um, a part of uh, two conversations we're going to have, the second being um, uh, Khomeiniism and, and um, that there is some correlation in your view between the, <laughs> the events that we've talked about today and, and the events that then take place in 1979 and the emergence of Khomeini as leader after that. You know, you mentioned a few, so I'll ask you a final question that's perhaps a segue into our next conversation uh, on another day. Um, you, you mentioned a few moments ago about uh, the foresight and the, the the shrewdness and the foresight that the Shah had um, in in recognizing even when he was complicit in it, even when he acceded to the American demands, in recognizing that if this coup took place, it could lead to the end of the monarchy. Um, you've said that after 1953, the Pahlavi regime, despite what looks like a, a very, very strong 25 years, um, really lo lacks legitimacy and that the Shah forever remains under the shadow of Mossadegh. What are the implications of that over the, the next 20 years? I mean, it, any regime needs to have some sort of legitimacy. Why do, why do you obey orders? Why do you obey rules, uh, uh, laws? Uh, the, the source has to have some sort of legitimacy. And I think the, the Pahlavis basically lost that legitimacy by the fact that they had overthrown uh, what was seen as a popular legitimate government. But more than that, they had basically brought back the imperial powers, Britain and United States, i.e. they had taken away national independence. And of course, the 20th century was the age of nationalism and being tarred with being anti-nationalist, uh, they really delegitimized uh, the, the Pahlavi dynasty. So, uh, I mean, regimes can survive by force, uh, but when there is a crisis, you need some sort of legitimacy to be able to argue and try to get support. So when the, the Shah in the 1970s faced fairly minor difficulties, uh, you know, there was a slight t t decline in oil revenues, there was pressure about torture and lack of democracy. These were minor issues on the whole. Uh, and most regimes could have survived that. The Shah's regime couldn't survive that because it just lacked the legitimacy. But are you? Would you go so far as to say? I mean, through all of those years, the booming economy, the the strong military, the white revolution, the modernization, uh, all, that all through all of that, the, the Pahlavi regime still lacks legitimacy. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you could see that. In fact, he, the Shah did all these acrobatics, uh, like the. 2,500-year celebrations, right. the White Revolution, they were all done as a way of trying to get legitimacy. Dr. Ervand Abrahimian, it's a, a great pleasure. I thank you. I look forward to the next conversation. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Dr. Yervand Abrahamian is a renowned Iranian-American scholar and author and the distinguished professor of Iranian and Middle Eastern history and politics at the City University of New York. His latest book, Oil in Crisis, From Nationalism to Coup d'État, was published last year. Dr. Yervand Abrahamian joined me from New York City today. This is full time for the Rook Media series, The Contemporary History of Iran, Part 25. Please check out our regular editions of Rook uh, and all things related at rookmedia.com, including previous episodes of this program, this series, uh, etc. Our website again, rookmedia.com, where you can also become a patron and support our program. Thanks to the amazing team who make Rook Media happen. Talented Anahita, Super Patty Saw, Ponta the Artist, Savvy Roham, Ahoy Merdad, the fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shaya. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you've not done so already.
Find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi and Mizun Machine.